Welcome to Dark Horse Auto and Diesel. In this video, I'm going to show you how to change the water pump and timing chains on a 3.5 liter Duratec Ford engine. And the procedure should be pretty much the same for the 3.7 EcoBoost. So the water pump is actually behind the timing cover. It's a really bad engineering idea because if you have any kind of water pump failure, it just dumps coolant right into the crankcase. And I don't think I need to explain why that's bad. So this whole job can be done in the vehicle. It's significantly more difficult just because you've got this much room to work on everything underneath the hood. But the procedure is going to be largely the same with everything. I just have the advantage of it being easier to work on, and I can actually show you a lot easier what we're going to be doing here. Things might be in a little bit different order than what you'll have to if you're doing it in the vehicle, but the main thing is once we get down to the timing chains and stuff, that part will all be exactly the same. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is take the intake manifold off here. So we'll go ahead and get all the wires unhooked from it. Let's push in on that. That pops out. Go ahead and get this out of our way. Get this green wire while we're at it. It's very delicate, so be careful with it. pop these three wiring clips out of here. Obviously mine's got a couple of broken clips and stuff on it from previous mechanic. So yours might have a couple more things holding it down than what mine does. Now we'll come over here to the back side of the manifold and we're going to take this off. If you're doing this inside the vehicle, it's going to be pretty much impossible to get that off beforehand so you'll probably just pull it with the manifold but you just give that a pull and it pops out of there so we just got eight millimeter bolts here and there's one hidden underneath this wire here that isn't being very cooperative with me right now and then back here there is a little support bracket for this and you can pick which bolt you want to take off I'm going to take this one here just because I can reach it easier in the vehicle you're probably going to want to take this one out next I'm going to start getting the valve covers off those are pretty simple as well and it's not 100% necessary to remove this harness here, but I'm going to just for ease of working on stuff. This here on mine anyway is a 13 millimeter. Really, it's a good idea at this point to go ahead and cover this up with something. All right, now that I have zero chance of losing my 10 millimeter socket down there, we'll move on. So we'll go ahead and get our uh, fuel injectors unclipped here. Real simple, push in on that, pull out. Go ahead and do that on both sides while we're at it. And then just Pop them off of these studs here. And then we'll come to this side. This one's fun if it's in the vehicle. this section of the harness. Mm. Sometimes these things get 
kind of difficult. Nothing broke. Don't be surprised if that happens to you on at least one of them. Oh, that's great. All right, minor surgery time. Thankfully, that red part isn't exactly critical. It's just kind of a redundant safety feature to make sure this thing doesn't end up popping loose on you. There we go. If you were doing this in the vehicle, you'd probably be about an hour deep into this already. Go ahead and unhook you too so we can get that wiring harness further out of my way. And you. And then we'll move along to the front one. You don't have to unhook the crank sensor down here because you have to pull this little cover off. So if you have any of these left over, you're obviously going to want to take those off because all of these have to come out of here. Like 90% of mine are broken. So next we'll get our coils pulled out of here. That's just going to be 8 millimeter. Grab a hold of it and just wiggle it out of there. Sometimes they're a little stuck. You'll probably have a fun time with these if you're doing this in the vehicle. <sighs> I can't recommend prying on it like I just like I just did. But I'm going to be replacing them anyway, so it doesn't matter. And next what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this off camera. It's optional, but I'd recommend it. I'm going to get my shop vac and just kind of suck all this crap out of here just so that we have a cleaner area to work in because we're going to be taking these off here real soon. And I don't want to be getting contaminants in my good engine. Just to make things a little easier, get it out of my way, I'm going to take this hose off and that. You just move that thing over and it just pops right off. All right, now we can go ahead and start taking our valve cover bolts out. And these are all 10 millimeter. Mm, that one sounds nice. Now these are all captive inside there. They got a little grommet that holds them in. Let's just make sure they're all loose. And next we'll get under here and gently Pry up on it. Sometimes these are pretty stuck on here. Just be patient with it. I can't imagine these valve covers are cheap to buy. And one thing that makes it difficult too is you've got all these little grommets in here and around the sensor that we have to kind of pull through the cover and just work your way around it and try not to mar up the gasket mating surface in the process.
I feel sorry for anybody that has to do this with the engine still in the engine bay. This sucks right now. <clears throat> Now we move on to the back one, which now I'm really glad that I don't have this thing in the vehicle. Keep in mind on this one, there's a bolt, not a stud. Now same deal, gently work it loose. So next we're going to work on the belts here, taking those off, and you'll notice that the power steering pump and the belt isn't on here right now. That's because I left the pump in the vehicle. The thing with that belt for the power steering though is uh, I would recommend just cutting it off. Don't bother taking it off to try to save it. It's what they call a stretch belt. It's a one-time use belt. There's no tensioner or anything like that. So I just cut it off while it was still in the vehicle. And then the other belt here, that's pretty self-explanatory. There's uh, just use a 3 8 ratchet, 3 8 breaker bar, whatever, and get in here. And there's a little indicator on there. You won't be able to see that in the vehicle. But you're going to rotate it this way, clockwise, to loosen the belt. And now we'll go ahead and take the tensioner off of the engine. There's three bolts that hold it on, and those are eight millimeters. Wow, that one's already loose. Now that tensioner is another thing I'd recommend, since you're this far into it, just go ahead and replace it while you got everything off, just for future reliability. And so now, if you're doing this in the vehicle, you're going to have to support the engine, because we got to take this engine mount off. And to remove that, there's... Uh, 15 millimeter bolts, one there, one down here, one right there. And depending on how things are inside the vehicle, you may have to take it apart here as well. Those are also 15 millimeter. Then we're going to pop this one loose here, 13 millimeter. Now these bolts are different, so remember where they go. Right, then next we're going to take our crank pulley off, and that's an 18 millimeter there. I can buck. And uh, having some helpers is beneficial. What are you doing? So, it doesn't take anything special. Get back, Beagle. Doesn't take anything special, just a regular old three-jaw puller. Got mine from Harbor Freight. I've had it for years. And you should probably know how one of these works. Being that this is from Harbor Freight is kind of scaring me. And it's starting to move. And it'll keep getting easier as you go. Obviously, I'm just using this pry bar to keep the engine from spinning along with this thing. And I think I'm going to run out of threads. That sucks. So a little tip here, if you need to. All I've done is a little 3 8 drive extension fits pretty decent in there and normally I wouldn't want to do that but given the situation here it's already most of the way out and there's not really much tension on it it's not going to hurt anything so we'll 
Let's finish pulling it off here. And there we go. Thanks for the help, Beagle. Now we can go ahead and start taking the bolts for our timing cover out, and there is a bunch. One missing there, that's convenient. Those are all gonna be 10 millimeter. We are actually gonna take this little piece off here just because it gets in the way of these two, well, mainly that bolt. should be all of them. Now we can work on getting this cover actually off of here. Definitely want to be careful with that. I've heard of many cases of them breaking. I think about right here they break off. And one thing with all these bolts here, you don't have to have them all in the exact order. You just got to remember the six longer ones go up top here, and then the rest of them are all the same going all the way around. So this is the timing set that we're going to be putting on this engine. And so what we're going to do is go ahead and get it all unboxed, which I already have, and make sure all of your pieces are there. Now this particular kit has the uh, cam phasers and stuff with it. We got these here. It's got secondary chains, solenoids for the uh, phasers and all that. This is definitely the more expensive kit, but this engine's got almost 200,000 miles on it. So I figure it's just good preventative maintenance. And I would recommend if you plan on keeping the vehicle for any length of time, going with the same kit. I paid, I think it was like 600 bucks for it on Rock Auto. Whereas the kit without the phasers, without all the variable timing stuff, was uh, I think like 170. So a significant price difference, but what's your time worth? Do you really want to do this job again if one of them phasers fails? Get everything laid out. I've got my stuff kind of laid out here where it's positioned on the engine. And like with these phasers, you'll notice they have R and L on them. The way that's going to work is that's relative to the engine. So when you're working on the front of it, it's going to be backwards. So your right will be on your left and your left will be on your right. As far as the engine is concerned, this is its right side. This is its left side. So with that said, I'd recommend laying all your parts out how you're going to look at the engine. And then with the uh, secondary tensioners, okay, so yeah, this one here, you can see the LH for left hand. So when you're looking at the engine, that will be on the right. And this one, it says RH, that will be on your left while looking at the front of the engine. Comes with two of these two. This is for your valve covers. Now, if you got a decent valve cover set like I did, it's the whole kit. These are going to be redundant because the valve cover seals came with it. I'll kind of go over those briefly. This is your main tensioner, main tensioner arm, crank sprocket, main chain guide, your main chain, another main chain guide for the top right of the engine. This one here is for the opposite side. Secondary chain, secondary cam sprocket, VVT sprocket, and the same over here. I have one important note with this. So this is actually an updated part from Ford, or Cloys in this case, and it will require an, a new bolt. So you will have to order that. I'll show you the part number here for that in a minute, but I'll take this over to the engine and show you. So this piece here is actually going to replace this piece. So one of the main differences between this piece and the original piece, obviously, besides the fact that one is 
the new one is completely made of plastic, which I'm not a fan of. That's why I use the term upgrade loosely, because the original one's metal backed, which is obviously going to be a lot stronger. But anyway, that's what they decided to do. But so because of that, this bolt here is going to have to be a longer bolt. When looking at the engine, the chain is riding on our left side of the guide. But once you put this piece in, the chain is actually going to ride on the right side, our right side of the guide. I don't know why they changed it, but leave it to engineers. And also with this kit, they did include new bolts for the VVT sprockets. That's very important because the all these bolts are torque to yield, meaning they're one-time use. You take them out and you throw them away because they stretch. If you don't know much about torque to yield bolts, I'd highly recommend you look into them. It's interesting, but kind of stupid at the same time that you use a bolt once. But once again, engineers, they were nice enough to include these bolts, but you are also going to have to go to the Ford dealership or somewhere else that you can get good parts and get new bolts for your cam sprockets and also for your crank pulley because all of those are also torque to yield. Why they didn't include this in a $600 kit, I don't know. Personally, I think it's kind of dumb that they would include some of the bolts, but not all of them. So the next thing we're going to do is make sure our engine is in time before we start tearing everything apart. The way this is going to work is you're looking at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 4 o'clock for the timing marks. Basically what it amounts to is that this cam phaser, the dot on it, it needs to be at a 90 degree angle with the top of the head. And then the same on this side, here's a timing mark there. And down here, the timing mark, the little dot's gonna be at four o'clock and the keyway is gonna be at approximately one o'clock as well. And one thing that'll help, it's not required. You can do this job without the special holding tools. You know, this is what they look like. There's a part number if you wanna order some for yourself. And basically all this does is this just locks into like some flat spots on the cams. You can use a wrench to hold the cams in place when you're loosening and tightening your bolts. That's basically what that tool is doing, is just simulating a wrench. And if you get the kit, it also comes with this guy here. We won't be using that on this engine. This is for the uh, dual cam phaser engines, where they have actually four cam phasers for the whole engine. So this, all this is is just a tool to hold the uh, secondary tensioner down when you're messing with your chains. All right, then once you got your tools put on there, this is what it's gonna look like. See how it's sitting, sitting flat against the head on both sides, and it's locked into the cams, and then the same over here. And you definitely wanna make sure that these marks are pointing up, because if you have these cams flipped over the other way, 180 degrees out, the tools will still fit on them. So I want to pause real quick here and show you guys the stuff on the dual phaser engines. Conveniently, this came into the shop before I got the original video edited. This is actually on a uh, 2014 Taurus. Obviously, our tool here is not going to fit with these little hoses in the way, little pipes. So we're going to have to remove those. There's three 8mm bolts there. Now... Should be able to get our tool to drop down in there. I don't have it perfectly lined up yet, but you get the idea there. First thing we'll do is we'll take these off, the little solenoid holder thingies. Pretty much all of this is going to be 8 millimeter. If it's not 8 millimeter, I will specify. Otherwise, just assume it's all 8 millimeter. Next, we will remove the primary chain tensioner. And there will be some tension on it, obviously. So just watch for that. And then we'll remove the tensioner arm, and that just slides right off the dowel here. And then next, we will remove the left side guide here. Now we'll go ahead and remove our two guides here. Yeah. 
right now this one here we can't remove that yet until we get the phaser out of the way because the bolt is actually like behind it you might be able to get it out with a wrench but there's literally no point so now we'll go ahead and just take our chain off now if you've got the dual phaser set up you're going to have to work a little harder to wiggle the chain out of there it's not going to just fall right out like this did on these uh, dual phaser motors it just doesn't quite want to come out of there so you end up loosening up this side here and just kind of pull it out a little bit and then you can fish your chain out of there this is a little difficult one-handed oh, you get the idea so you can see how it's kind of cut out right there it's not perfectly round that gives you access to get the chain fished out of there now with these tools holding the cams in place now we can break loose the bolts going to all the sprockets and those are going to be a t55 Now on the dual phaser systems, they actually have a locking pin, well, that's that other tool I showed you, that helps remove these, but these don't. So you just work them off together. Now although we are throwing away the bolts, do not lose this washer, because that gets reused. Obviously, all my pick is doing there is it's uh, keeping the chain from catching on the ridge that's on the guide there. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done. And once you get it over the first ridge, it pops right off. This is obviously just on the dual phaser engines. We need to compress this tensioner a little bit down here in order to get the chain slid off. You can probably get it off of there without doing it but that's where this little tool comes in handy you just stick it down in this little hole right here Giggity. what you're gonna do is get this and kind of stick it down on the back side of the chain and you're gonna want it facing with the little uh, bump out piece there going towards the engine and then you just kind of push down on it and there's going to be some tension. I've already messed with it a bit. Uh, it's going to be a little difficult because there's going to be some oil pressure in there you have to overcome. But it should end up locking into a little divot on top of the tensioner there. And then you can go ahead and slide the chain over it. And I still have the bolts on here to keep me from dropping everything. But you can see now that the chain is loose. And we can go ahead and get these pulled off. And then just push down a little bit and then repeat on the other side and then we will remove the tensioners here and there's just two bolts and you have to move the tool to get to the back one but that's not a big deal Now we can go ahead and remove our last guide here. Don't forget that this has to be put back on before we put the VCT phaser back on there. So now we can go ahead and start taking our water pump loose. So now we'll get back in here and very, very gently pry on it. There's a nice little spot right here you can kind of get into. Keep in mind that's going to happen. Probably should have warned you about that first. Obviously we're going to be flushing the crankcase out. And just to keep the mess somewhat contained, I'm just letting it all run down into the crankcase.
Now you can go ahead and get your all your gasket surfaces cleaned up for your timing cover going around and your water pump. Make sure the water pump is especially clean and make sure you don't gouge any of this because if it leaks any coolant, it's gonna go right into the crankcase. Now to clean that, all I did, I mean, you can see I got a whole bunch of plastic bags stuck in here. That's just to keep all the excess crap from falling down into the crankcase. Obviously, I've already got it cleaned up, but there's really no point in showing you all that on video. I'll just give you a couple recommendations. One thing that you can use that can be pretty handy is just like an old uh, hotel room key. They're nice and soft because all of this that we're scraping here is aluminum. So you definitely want to be careful with what you're doing. Now you can use a razor blade, just be extremely careful, and if you start to feel any resistance, stop, because you might be gouging into the aluminum. It does make it a lot easier than using the uh, credit card or hotel key. I'd recommend getting some uh, scuff pad. And another thing that I found, I didn't even know these things existed until today, but one of these, it's basically that scuff pad, but in this form, and holy crap, this saves so much time. You're obviously not gonna get this into some of the tight places, like around your dowels and stuff. You're gonna do it by hand, and you know, areas like this, it just won't work. So there will still be a little bit of hand work involved, but nothing major. And what I like to do when I'm done anyway is just to go ahead and take a scuff pad over it by hand, just real gently, just to make sure I got all the pieces off, and also run it along with your, uh, your surface here instead of going this way. By running it this way, if you do have any grooves, it kind of helps make them go you know, perpendicular to where your fluid's gonna come out. If you have a scratch going across here, then you know obviously you've just created a leak point. And then once you get everything cleaned off good, go ahead and take some brake cleaner and some clean rags and just wipe everything down until it comes clean. Okay, now we can go ahead and install the water pump. Make sure all your gaskets are in their grooves like they're supposed to be. And then what we're gonna do is just dip our finger in some fresh coolant, put over the O-rings and kind of lubricate them a little bit so they can move as needed as we're torquing the bolts down. So I'm just kind of wiping it on there, no big deal. And then there's these little alignment dowels. There's one right there and one right there. And we'll just line those up with the corresponding holes in the block. And I'm going to wipe just a little bit of coolant on here, too. And we'll just start loosely threading our bolts in just to get them started. And they're all going to be torqued down to 89 inch-pounds for the 2007 to 2010 model years. And then if you have a 2011 or newer, you'll torque them to the 89. Then you'll tighten them an additional 45 degrees after the 89 inch-pounds. All I'm doing here is just lightly snugging them down just to draw the pump in a little bit evenly. Let's go a little bit at a time so we don't damage the pump. And I'm just snugging these down in the proper torque sequence, even right now. And we'll go back and just check them one more time. I've already got this kind of cleaned up and we're going to replace this seal. Pay attention to how it's positioned on here. The bottom part of that is about flush with the outer ring. And then you can use a screwdriver and pop it out or I've got a tool specifically made for removing seals. Make sure you don't gouge into the aluminum at all. Alright, then once you got your seal out, clean up the bore for it a little bit here. Make sure it's nice and clean so we get a good seal. Now we'll take and just clean it up real good. We're going to get some fresh clean oil and we're going to put it inside the seal bore and on the outside of the seal here. Make sure the seal is oriented properly. You want the side with the spring in it. You want that to go to the inside. And then what I've got here is an inch and seven eighths socket. I don't have a seal driver set. You can get one if you want, but this will suffice. And this is where it's going to get a little awkward because the way this timing cover is designed, it doesn't lay flat on the workbench. So you get it like this and just kind of use your beer gut to hold it in place. And just gently start tapping it in. And try to get it in as even as possible. All right. 
So once you've got it in there and square, it's about what it should look like. Now before we start putting the new timing chains on the engine, I want to show you this here. This is the part numbers for the bolts that I had to order. This top one here, that's that longer bolt right there that goes to this new chain guide. You need one of them. This one here, that is for the crankshaft pulley. This one we need two of for the exhaust side cams. Now this is if you're working on the two phaser engines. Now just like on the two phaser engines, you're going to need to get some new bolts. Uh, the part numbers, well, the crank part number is the same for the uh, the bolt for that, the crank pulley. But your, uh, your cam phaser bolts are going to be different. So um, there's the part number for the crank. And then your intake cam. And then your exhaust cam. And obviously with these cams, these cam bolts, you're going to need two of each. So now for this part, there's a certain order of things that we want to do it. You can deviate a little bit from some of the stuff, but if you do, you're just going to be making things more difficult for yourself. So just try to follow along in the order that I'm doing stuff here because that's going to be the easiest way to do it. So we have to put this guide on first because our sprocket will end up covering it here if we don't. And this is where that new bolt comes into play because it's a very different design on the guide because the old one, obviously, just doesn't quite cut it. And there's our new one. And now we'll go ahead and torque this down and it will be 89 inch-pounds. Actually, as far as all of this stuff goes, it's all going to be 89 inch-pounds. If it is not, I will specify so I don't have to keep repeating myself. Now just like on the two phaser motors, you need to make sure you put this guide on before you put your sprocket on here, otherwise you'll never be able to get to that bolt. Next we'll go ahead and install our tensioner for the secondary chains up here and make sure that you have the right one. And do not pull that pin yet. If you do, it's not the end of the world, but you're just creating more work for yourself. Now on the four phaser engines, it's going to be different here too. So you're going to take these two eight millimeter bolts off here that hold these in. And just pull these out and set them aside. Don't mix them up. On this particular engine, we are going to be reusing these. But this is also where you would replace those. Now to get the tensioner out, you can just take a pry bar very carefully get behind this guide on the bottom. It doesn't take much, it's just a bit much for your fingers. And then grab a hold of the tensioner itself and just lift up on it. Sometimes it gets a little stuck in there. And you may have to pry on it a little bit. And if you do, just take something soft and put over your cam there and just gently, there we go. Make sure the O-rings came out with it. Then we'll take our new tensioner here. Do not pull that out. Lubricate the O-rings and the body of it a little bit with some good, clean, fresh, new motor oil. And then you'll take and just drop it down into the hole and you'll feel it snap when the uh, O-ring gets seated. Then we'll take our bottom piece here, and it just slides over the bottom. All right, then once you have the tensioner on, you can go ahead and grab a hold of this little thing here and pull it out. But be extremely careful that you don't push down on this, because right now these are still deactivated. And when you push down on this, it activates it. You have to pull these out now, because otherwise when we go to put our sprockets back on, you won't be able to get that clip out. I don't even know if you can get the sprockets back on with the clip. I've never really tried. So the next step, we are going to take our exhaust cam gear, our secondary chain, our new phaser, and notice R. Important. So what we're going to end up doing is actually attaching the 
two sprockets and the chain together and then putting them on as an assembly. There isn't enough free play to put a sprocket on and then, you know, the chain and then the other sprocket. And just so that you're aware, you can put this on the wrong way, but it's going to be pretty obvious that it's on wrong. So if you have the teeth facing towards the front of the engine and you stick it on there, you'll notice that this is actually pretty much flush with the outside of the tensioner here. Obviously that's not going to work for us. So you flip it around to where the teeth are on the inside and it lines up right in the middle of the guide and the tensioner. So that's the way you're going to want it. And then with the phaser, you want the small section here to go towards the engine like this. All right, so here on the phaser, there's a timing mark there. We're not going to pay attention to that one right now. But there is one on the back side here that we are along with a timing mark on our exhaust cam sprocket. And then you'll notice the links on these chains that are gold. That's what we're going to line up with the timing marks. All right, now, so since we're working on the right side of the engine, this is going to be backwards, kind of. So when we're looking at this, we want this gold link to line up with that timing mark. This is how the timing marks should line up. So now, once we flip this around, we have our assembly that looks like this and we'll just slide it onto our camshafts. You really need to pay more attention on the dual phaser engines than on the single phaser. Dual phaser engines, there's actually an R and an L. So you need to line that up appropriately depending on which side of the engine that it's going on. You can kind of see the factory chain there. The link is slightly different colored. This is what it's gonna look like for your left side. Get that set up right. You want it to look like that. And then your right side, you want it to look like this. And the way you can check this is to actually take and flip this up and kind of orient it the way it's going to be inside the engine. And you can see our timing mark is here. So when you hold it up, you kind of hold it at a little bit of an angle, just like the engine is, because this timing mark, if you remember, is at um, about 11 o'clock on the right side. 1, 2 o'clock, whatever, on the left side of the engine. So we'll get, go ahead and get that put on there. Go ahead and just thread this in a couple turns, keep it from falling off on us. And try to run them on evenly. That way you don't put any weird stresses on the chain. When you're installing these sprockets, you may have to rotate one of the cams a little bit one way or the other just to get the keyways to line up. Just take a look at everything, make sure our chain's looking good. You have to look from the back side, make sure your timing marks are lined up. So you can just see that timing mark. It's underneath that gold link on this side yeah it corresponds with that link and this is pretty much identical to the uh, single phaser engines and I'm showing you this side because depending on the vehicle this back one here you may have to install it with the bolt already through it and then put it back in there and since I try to keep my channel in the PG 13 range I decided to not try to do that on camera. And it's a good idea to go ahead and get your bolts kind of started in there. Yes, these are the original bolts. I'm just doing this temporarily until the new bolts come in. Just gently snug it up for now, and I'll wait for the new bolts to come in, which I'm not going to show that because that part is exactly the same as the single phasers. So this next step is kind of weird. We're going to torque down these sprocket bolts. The proper procedure for that, there's, there's four steps to it. So the first step is to tighten it to 30 foot-pounds, loosen it one full turn, retighten it to 18 foot-pounds, and then spin it another 180 degrees. 30 foot-pounds. Loosen one full turn. 18 foot-pounds. Now the fun part, 180 degrees. Since obviously I'm gonna have to reset my breaker bar for that, I'm gonna put a little mark on this bolt. So that little mark I've got lined up with timing mark here, which is at this point more or less vertical. And let the sketchiness begin. And there we go. 
So now we'll repeat the same stupid process on the bolt for our phaser. We are there. So now hopefully you didn't screw up because if you got to take those back out, you got to get new bolts because you know, we just ruined them by stretching crap out of them. Because that's what torque to yield bolts do. Next what we'll do is we'll just repeat that process on this side. Now we have our left hand tensioner. And we'll go ahead and get our tool put back where it's supposed to go. And now we're going to repeat the process just like we did over here, but over here instead. Our VVT sprocket is going to go on our right side currently because when we flip it around, a little visual for you there. And then again over here. Now we carefully slide these on. I try to keep these centered up. Obviously based on the factory marks on that washer, it's not critical because they didn't make sure it was centered from the factory, but... Now we can go ahead and remove our pins after you've double checked and made sure everything is lined up and the timing marks are all good. So if you do accidentally pull these too early, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. It just makes life more difficult. All right, tensioner is engaged. Next, we're going to install a crank sprocket, which during the teardown, I obviously forgot to take the old one off. Oh, and we'll keep the washer off of this as well. And there does not appear to be any kind of proper orientation for this. It's the same both ways. Even on the factory one, it's got the little timing mark there at 4 o'clock. You flip it over, timing mark at 4 o'clock. Slipper on there. Now we will install our primary chain. And this is why we don't have any of the extra guides and stuff on that we don't have to because it makes this part a heck of a lot easier. We have colored links on one side. We got a gold one there. And then a blue one. And another blue one. So obviously the single colored link is going to go down here to our timing mark. And our two links that are the same color are going to line up here on our cam sprockets. Now we'll just start over here on the right side of the engine. And this is the important thing with this guide. When we took it apart, the chain actually rode on this side up against the guide, and then here they've switched it. Don't ask me why, but because I simply don't know. Water pump, it does not matter as long as it's on there. There is no specific timing mark for that. You have to spin it a little bit. And we already have a slight issue there. There we go. So it's likely you will have to rotate these a little bit just to get everything lined up properly on the chain. So don't be alarmed if it doesn't line up immediately. And then we'll come down here. And there. Okay, so you're going to notice at this point there's a whole bunch of extra slack. Make sure this chain is on the inside of this dowel pin here. Okay, so down here I've got the gold link lined up with the dot, but there's all this extra play, so it's just it's not going to stay there. But we'll fix that about right now. And the next step, we will install our upper left chain guide. Make sure the chain is riding in between the lips on the guide. Next, we'll install the guide for the left side of the engine, and that's this big long guy here with the two bolt holes in it.
So now that'll help hold this on a little bit to where it's supposed to go. But it's still, we still have a little bit of room to play with there. And we'll get to that momentarily because we're going to need that room to, we're going to have to adjust that slack in the chain. Next, we will install the tensioner arm, and that's just going to slide over this dowel here. So what we're going to do now is use our old crank pulley bolt here, which if you remember is 18 millimeter, and we're going to rotate the crankshaft just a little bit to take the slack out on this side and move it over to this side so that we have an easier time getting our tensioner in, and also it, it gets rid of this crap here that's causing problems with keeping it in time. Hold that on there, and then it should spin relatively easily. Yep, there we go. Now we will put our primary chain tensioner on. Be careful not to lose that right now. You want to make sure that the groove on the tensioner arm lines up with the little bump up on the tensioner itself. I should have showed you that before I put it on there, but if you've made it this far, pretty sure you can figure out what I'm talking about. Make sure all of our timing marks are lined up where they're supposed to be. One link down there, up here, and right there. And now we can go ahead and pull our pin. So I keep getting ahead of myself here, not a big deal. I'll show you how to fix it if you're stupid like me. But ideally, you wanna leave these off. That way it's a lot easier to activate that tensioner. But in order to activate it, I'm not actually gonna pull those off. I'm just gonna show you the trick if you're stupid. So you can just get in here and just gently pry a little bit. Now if you have these, uh, if you have these off, you can just push straight down on it and you'll hear the same noise that we're about to hear. But well, That didn't work very well. So if my ratchet didn't slip, you would have heard it click. But when you push down on this, you'll actually hear it click a little bit, and then it'll pop up, and then the tensioner is activated. Now we're going to replace our solenoid here and the seals for it. So this is going to be the same on both sides. I'm just going to show you one. Obviously, this would be easier to take off if it's on the engine, but... You can just use an impact and gently, there we go, and that just pulls out, and then we'll go ahead and pick this seal out of here, and then these ones down here, they're actually split, kind of hard to see, but there it splits apart, that's normal, the new ones are like that as well, just go ahead and just kind of split it apart and work it off around the outside of it. And there's three of them. Make sure we're clean. Then we'll get some fresh oil here. Kind of dip your finger in and just lightly lubricate all the seals as we put them in. That when you kind of have to compress it in a little bit just to kind of help it helps hold it in there and the same with these nice light coating of fresh oil and just be careful you don't over stretch them just go little bits at a time work it around oh. Notice there is a little bit of differences on the new solenoids. The old one's got a screen that goes all the way around. And the new one, it's actually built in. You can kind of see if it focuses. You can see the port right there and the screen on it. It's just all built into a 
into the assembly. So we'll take and just put that in there. And we'll torque that down once it's on the engine. Now the thing that I wanted to mention about the gaskets here, the little seals, these did not come with the timing set. They came with the valve cover gasket set, which makes no sense to me. Hopefully somebody in the comments can make this make sense. So the stuff for this, you can't remove this without removing the timing cover. So it's not like under a standard valve cover gasket replacement that you're going to be removing these from the engine. So why they include these gaskets with that, I don't know. And why they don't include it with the timing set when you're definitely going to be taking this off, I really don't understand that. So if somebody can make that make sense for me, please do. I mean, you should be ordering valve cover gaskets anyway because you have to remove them, but make sure you do because at least the Felpro kit that I bought for uh, the valve covers came with these seals, but the Cloy's timing set did not. So be mindful of that. I mean, if they look good, you probably could reuse them, but since I have them, I'm going to put them on and I'd recommend it anyway. Then I'm going to take and put a little bit of clean oil inside the bore here. Now we'll go ahead and install these pieces, and they are labeled right hand. Make sure the dowel pins line up. And then don't forget to torque your bolt for the solenoid up here. And if you're reusing these, which I don't exactly recommend, but the customer didn't want to spend $900 on the full kit and just wanted to spend $160 on this one, you want to make sure that these screens are, they don't have any big pieces of gunk on them or anything like that. And then just carefully slide them back in. This is going to be just like the single phaser engines. Torque these two down to 71 foot-pounds plus 20 degrees. Now we'll go ahead and remove our cam holding tools, which they may be bound in there a little bit. That one wasn't. And now we're going to rotate the engine from the crankshaft here at least two full revolutions. That way we can make sure everything is in time, there's no binding or anything like that. So if you feel any binding during this process, stop immediately. You probably have valves hidden pistons. So just make note of where our timing marks are. Basically what we want to do is just spin it around until all of our timing marks are where they currently are, as in 4 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 1 o'clock. The chain marks will no longer line up. That doesn't matter. That's only for assembly. Well, we just made it through two full revolutions and there was no binding, so we did something right. Next, we're going to get the timing cover installed here and I'll put some pictures up right now of the torque sequence and also a little guide on like the torque specs, which the torque specs are completely ridiculous. They want you to tighten the bolts up so much, back some of them off, tighten some other ones up, and let's be real, I'm not doing that. I think it is, you can do it if you want to, and normally I'm super picky about following everything by the book, but the way this is set up, I'm just going to show you how I do it. Torquing down bolts a little bit and then loosening them with silicone, personally I think is a terrible idea because then you just broke the seal that you just made. Basically what I'm going to do is just go all the way around in sequence, get them all like finger tight, and then go through the quarter inch ratchet and just do a little turn on every single one of them in sequence. And then just keep doing that, just a little tighter every time. And then eventually I'll go through and torque them down to their final torque specs. If you want, you can just follow along with what I'm going to do, or you can follow it by the book and have a freaking stroke in the process. It's literally a 12-step sequence. And I can tell you, if I go through that whole 12-step sequence, I'm going to need a 12-step program when I'm done. Now, before you start getting your silicone put on and everything, 
make sure everything is like operating room clean. Make sure it's clean enough that you wouldn't have a problem licking it. I'll go ahead and get all of our silicone on and just put a nice thin bead, uh, about eighth inch bead all the way around. The book says to do a 3 16 bead down here. Usually what I do is just squirt some on there and then spread it out with my finger to where it's just completely covering everything. Make sure you go all the way around your bolt holes. And also, don't forget about these three points here, because otherwise you will have a leak. The book says to take these two bolts right here and get some spares and cut the heads off and use them as locating pins. I'm not doing that. I could, but I don't feel the need to. So what I'm going to do is actually just stick the bolts through those two holes and get them started and then go ahead and pull everything in. Doing what I'm doing here is not exactly by the book, but I've done it countless times and I have never once had a leak. I've got them two bolts in the top there and I've just got my finger in that hole. Giggity. it line up on the other dowels and then we can go ahead and just start getting all of our bolts started. Now these I'm not doing in any kind of sequence at all. I'm just getting them where they just touch basically. Then we'll grab this part of our engine mount and get that put on here because these bolts also help hold the timing cover on. So now we're going to go ahead and put the final torque on all these bolts here. I am going to follow some of the steps that are shown on the instructions. As far as the loosening things back up, like I already said, we are definitely not doing that. So what we're going to do is bolts 1 through 22 as listed on the picture that I showed you earlier. We're going to go ahead and torque those to 89 inch-pounds. So our three motor mount bolts here, those are considered 23 through 25, and we're going to torque those to 133 inch-pounds now. And on this engine, there is no bolt 26. If you have a different variation, there may be a bolt 26, there might not. And now it wants me to loosen them a full turn. We are not doing that. So now we'll take bolts 23 through 25, which like I said is these motor mount bolts, and we're going to tighten them to 22 foot-pounds. And now 23 through 25, we're going to tighten an additional 90 degrees. And to do that, for the extra torque that I'm probably going to need, I'm just going to go ahead and use a half-inch drive. And that's the last we're going to mess with these bolts here. 23 through 25. If you have a bolt 26, there's supposed to be extra steps. I'm not going to cover them. I put them on the uh, picture there, so go ahead and just look at those if you need to. Next, we're going to do bolts 1 through 22, which is all of the perimeter bolts, and torque those to 177 inch-pounds following the proper torque sequence. Now that those are all torqued to 177, now I need to go through all of the perimeter bolts again and tighten them an additional 45 degrees. Okay. 
All right, now we're done with that, and I can pretty much guarantee you there's not going to be any leaks because holy crap, those are tight. Next, we're going to install the crankshaft pulley. I've already got my crank pulley cleaned up, and I'm going to put some fresh oil on it as well just to help it slide on and not damage the seal. Now, this is not keyed in any way, which is why it's a torque to yield bolt. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to replace that. At least I think I mentioned it earlier. If not, I'm mentioning it now. This can really go on in any orientation you want. doesn't really matter. Just kind of get it slid on there a little bit. And I do believe I mentioned earlier that we are reusing this washer. So make sure you keep that. And then we'll take our new bolt. And of course, it's not in far enough. So all I'm going to do here is just take a dead blow hammer and just kind of give her some love taps. Make sure you don't get any crap in there like I just did. And of course, that's not far enough. Come on, really? Definitely don't hit on that with a regular steel hammer because you will end up cracking this thing almost guaranteed. Oh, come on, really? If you don't have a dead blow, you can use a block of wood and a hammer. There, the threads are catching. Now we need to get our tools put back on top of the cams to hold this because we've got to put some serious torque on this. So I'm going to go ahead and get those set back up. Now we're going to go ahead and torque this bolt to 89 foot-pounds, not inch-pounds. We've moved up to the big leagues now. There it just rotated a little bit, and that is why we are using the cam holding tools. Not particularly fond of putting this much stress on the timing chains, but there's literally no other choice unless you can figure out some way to hold this in place. Now we will loosen it one full turn, 360 degrees. Now we tighten it to 37 foot-pounds. And now I've got a couple crappy witness marks on here, and we're going to go an additional 90 degrees. And there we are. And now the final major difference, you know, once you get all this other stuff done, then the last thing you're going to do is go ahead and put these back on. And those you want to be pretty accurate with the torque spec on them because that does hold the camshaft cap down. And those are 71 inch pounds plus 45 degrees. I assume that one is the same as well, that guy right there. Um, I just ended up putting it at the same torque spec. Slight differences with the uh, valve covers and stuff because you got extra sensors here, solenoids, but everything else is going to be almost identical. Close enough that if you can't figure it out, then you probably shouldn't be doing this job. So off camera, I went ahead and put the motor mount all back together and put a new drive belt tensioner on, which I got to make a note on this. If you have a Chilton's book, I'm pretty sure the torque spec for this is wrong because it says that it is 18 foot-pounds, which that's got to be way high because these are only, you know, 8 millimeter headed bolts. So I think that means they're like M6 or something like that, M5 diameter. All the bolts for all the timing components and stuff, that was all 89 inch pounds. So 89 inch pounds is not all that much torque. And if you remember for some of these, these were 177 inch pounds and they're bigger bolts 
and 177 inch pounds is like 14 and three quarter foot pounds. So there's no way you can tell me that these smaller bolts are gonna take that much more torque than the uh, timing cover bolts. So just a fair warning, do not tighten these to 18 foot pounds unless they're different on different engines. But on the 3.5 I'm working on here, it is definitely wrong. The uh, timing cover has the silicone on it's already cured overnight. So I don't feel bad about putting oil on it and stuff. So I've got some used oil that I'm going to use that's nice and clean, just used. And what I'm going to do is just, just start dumping it over all the timing components here, over the uh, cam lobes down in here. And there's two reasons I'm going to do that. One is to just provide some lubrication for our first startup because you definitely don't want to start the engine with all this just dry, no lubrication. And also what it's going to do is help flush out a whole bunch of the crap that we got down in the bottom of the pan during all the cleanup process. I got everything rinsed down with oil now. I'm just draining it straight out. It's actually still coming out a little bit. When we do start this thing up, I'm going to show you a little trick on how to make it build oil pressure before it actually fires. But, you know, up until that point, the chains are not running without lubrication. Now I'm just going to clean up all the gasket mating surfaces here. We'll put some oil around these so that the new gasket slides on easier. And we'll also put some oil on the inside of the seal bore on the valve cover itself. And then we'll go ahead and get these attached. If you have a little bit of oil residue left around this, it's not a big deal. But here and here, and the same on the other side, you want to make sure it is extremely clean because we're going to end up putting a little dab of silicone here at this uh, joint. Don't need a whole lot, just kind of smear a little on there. About like that. That's good there. Then we'll just take it and set it on here. And we'll actually use the bolts to help draw that down. I'm not really going to follow any particular sequence at the moment, just going to try to get it drawn down some. Now, since I've got a couple started already, I'm going to use this, but very, very gently. Just trying to save myself a little time here. Just kind of running it down until it touches. Now I'm going to hand snug all these down in sequence. Next I will torque these all down in sequence to 89 inch pounds. Then repeat on the other side, it's uh, slightly different, but the book just says right side, it's similar. So just kind of follow that basic pattern on the other side and you'll be all right. And once everything's torqued down, just take a look at all your spark plug bores here and make sure that you see shiny metal around all the, all the way around the gasket there. I had a couple, I already fixed it, but uh, had a couple where it just wasn't quite over where it should be. So all I did was just take a, a little punch like this and just gently tap along the edge in here to try to kind of drive it down where it's supposed to be. Just be very gentle with it. And be careful too that you're paying attention to, especially like this one here, because when I was doing the other side, um, it was actually the gasket center part was still sitting up here. And as I tightened it down, it actually just tore it out. So I, I wasn't paying enough attention to what I was doing, and thankfully I had a couple extra seals laying around. So I had to drive it out and put a new one in, but just be mindful of that. Now we're gonna go ahead and reinstall the upper intake manifold, and I've gotta clean this up a little bit yet, but go ahead and get that cleaned up. And then we'll flip our manifold over, and we'll just take that gasket out of there. It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I need to show you how to do that. Then you go ahead and clean that up as necessary, and then you'll take your new gasket and just push it in there. It only goes one way. Now we'll get our manifold put back on. A um, little bit of oil might come out. That's not a, bit, not a big deal at all. 
don't forget to hook this here back up to your PCV valve back there. Uh, some of this is going to depend on how you took it apart. And like this bracket here, I already took the bolt off the side of the head. Since I took the manifold off with the engine out of the vehicle, I got to go ahead and take this completely off. And just to make things easier, I'm going to go ahead and get this kind of attached. And then I'll just flop it forward so it's out of the way. Now we should be able to get this put back on here. Probably should have waited to put this wiring harness on until after this part. But it'll be fine. And just make sure that your gaskets stay in place because if they fall out, you're going to have a massive vacuum leak when you start the engine and it's going to run like crap and you're going to spend a while trying to figure out what happened. I know because I've done it. All the bolts for this are the same except for this one here. It's going to be the long guy here. Go ahead and just get them kind of threaded in. So before I torque anything down, I'm going to go ahead and get this hose hooked back up to the PCV valve. Which is not exactly the easiest task to do. It's one of the reasons I'm leaving the manifold loose a little bit. So now we'll go ahead and get these bolts torqued down. Some models have a bolt here. Mine does not. Not really sure why they did that, but I'm not an engineer. Ask them. And now an additional 45 degrees. I know it's probably not exact, but certainly close enough. And then we'll get this hooked up so it's out of our way. Oh. See how many times I drop this. None would be ideal. Got it. And just snug those down. There's probably a Torx back on them, but just snug is fine. Just don't be stupid with it. I've got it pretty much ready to run, uh, what, but what we're going to do is crank it over a whole bunch until we have full oil pressure through the, full, through the whole system. And the reason for that is because the tensioners are hydraulic actuated, and so, you know, I don't want this thing starting up and having the chains flopping around without uh, proper pressure in the tensioners. So there's two ways you can go about that. I'm going to go the safer route and just pull relay 26 that's for the fuel pump alternatively you can also just get in and hold your foot to the floor while you're cranking on it but i just prefer to pull the fuel pump relay that way there's no chance of screwing anything up all the fluids are good fuel pump relay is unhooked or removed i should say so we're going to go ahead and crank on it until we get oil pressure and then we'll put the relay back in and fire it back up that little indicator right there. When that goes out, we'll stop cranking on it. Put the fuel pump relay back in and fire it up, hopefully. Cycle the key a few times to build up some fuel pressure. All right, that should be good. Moment of truth. leaks. 